so welcome all. Uh, I think you all know what the topic's going to be today. We're looking at improvisation and what it's got to do with uh, Aikido. So uh, my special guest today is Charles, Charles Harris. He's a fellow teacher with me in Aikido for daily life. Uh, we've known each other for quite a long time now, haven't we, Charles? Horrendously long time. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> Hard luck, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> so uh, we, although our paths crossed, um, Charles only joined Aikido for Daily Life a couple of years ago. Probably, well, actually, it's probably three or four years ago now, but with COVID, you kind of lose sight of time. Um, and I've worked more closely with him over that period, not only because of that, but also because I do verbal Aikido with him. And um, in one of our last topics, we had Peter Connolly talking about Aikido and mindfulness. And I was chatting to him after then, he said, you should do a session on improvisation. And I thought, good idea, but I don't know anyone. And then in a verbal Aikido session, Charles opened his mouth and said he used to direct people and, 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 and train them in improvisation. And I thought, ah, here's a man that will be able to relate to not only the Aikido, but the improvisation. So enough of me. Charles, tell us a little bit about your Aikido journey and also your career generally, please. My Aikido journey. OK, so I started off, I was actually um, with a guy. We were trying to do a film on a thing called macrobiotics, um, which never got made, um, but it did change my diet. Uh, it changed a lot of things. And I was interested in doing meditation at the same time. Uh, and I was chatting to this guy and I said, you know, I'd love to do meditation, but I find sitting, staring at a wall enormously boring. So he said, well, there's not just sitting meditation, which is what most people think of as meditation. There's moving meditation, which includes something like Aikido. In fact, he took me to look at an Aikido class uh, and I thought that was rather interesting. And therefore, being, being a normal human being, did nothing about it for about four years. Uh, and then started a class um, with a guy called Andy Hathaway. Um, briefly, um, it was, I, I liked it because it was at the East West Centre where you got a free breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning. And they stopped doing free breakfast, so I stopped doing Aikido. Um, and then some year, a few years later, I was looking around thinking, I might try doing this thing. And I, I you probably realise there's a, there's a theme in this, which is I generally do the things that are easy. And um, I happened to find out that literally down the road, a short distance down the road in St. John's Wood, a, a man called uh, David Curry, who I'd never heard of, um, was starting uh, an Aikido class in a local school, a part of a, a local authority ILEA evening class. And I went along and haven't looked back. How many years ago is that now? That was 1984. Ah, same day I, the year I started. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, um, I, I was key Aikido, as you, as you know. Uh, those of you know David, who studied under Kenneth Williams, at that time was Key Society, which then became, what was it? Um, British, British Great Britain. That's right. And then he split off and became British Key Aikido Association. We split off, everyone splits off in Aikido, and I've since then been trying desperately to try and find ways of putting things back together again, which is why I was so pleased to join Quentin. So meanwhile, while you were sort of pursuing your Aikido journey, um, what were you doing professionally? I was a film writer and director. Um, I was directing a lot of corporate films, um, you know, sort of advertising type films. Um, also theatre, fringe theatre, um, and writing scripts, writing screenplays, tiddling around, thinking about writing novels maybe sometime or other. Um, yeah, keeping myself fairly occupied as, as, one, as, as best I could, doing whatever I could, in the hope I would somewhere or other do something that somebody would watch one day. And did they? Um, yeah, well, they watched the corporates, um, the people, because they generally had to, people in the Nat West had to watch their Nat West corporates. And I moved into um, soap opera, did Brooks, directed some Brooksides and ended up directing a feature film called Paradise Grove. Um, and I'm now writing novels. In the meantime, I put on a few plays, which was good fun too. And that's where I first started learning about acting. I've never been an actor. 
but I learned a lot about acting and directing in the process. And that's where I first stumbled upon improvisation. Okay, so in what way did you stumble upon improvisation? It was a workshop being run by a great director called Mike Alfreds um, through the Directors Guild. Um, we were all, all asked, there's a number of directors, not, not very many, a small, small handful of directors, and we had to get a couple of actors together and put on or prepare a piece that he was then going to discuss from the uh, Frederick Lorca play Blood Wedding. I don't know if anyone knows that. It's a very intense uh, set in um, Spain in the, I think, 20s. Um, and uh, we prepared one scene and we went along. And I, at that time, all I knew about preparing was to work with the actors on the lines and the characters. And I mean, inevitably, you kind of did a bit of improvisation, whether you thought about it as improvisation or not, but it was very much working on the script. Uh, and he completely opened our eyes. He started, he just took our actors um, and he started doing improvisations around the story and around the characters that had nothing directly to do with the script. For example, he had them, you know, he, he pointed out the fact that it would be very hot. It was a, you know, a, it was a very poor area. So he had them improvising, being, you know, sort of working in the heat, working in the fields with very little to help, um, improvising the relationships between the characters, working on the emotional subtext of the story, um, bringing out all kinds of things that uh, I'd sort of not really touched on in the, in the preparation I'd done. So I started looking further uh, into what improvisation, what improvisation could do for actors. Whether, I mean, people think of improvisation very often in terms of things like whose line is anyway, which is great fun and uses a lot of the same improvisational games that actors will use in rehearsal anyway, but it's used enormously in rehearsing things that are very scripted and it's loses a lot, a lot in filmmaking. A lot of the times you might have a script of a scene but you can improvise a lot around it. So would you like to give us uh, a definition of what improvisation means for you? Um, it's a good question. And I've been thinking a lot about that. And I've been thinking about relationships, connections with, um, uh, with Aikido, because until you asked me, I'd never even thought about connections with Aikido, although there are... And you took my next okay. question. Yes. Um, improv I suppose the thing about improvisation is, is, is it, and this is going to partly answer your next question, it is dealing with the moment, it's dealing with the thing itself, it's, it's, it's going off the script, um, off the things you've planned and allowing things to happen spontaneously, which sounds very vague, but it can be very specific when you start looking at detailed, particularly you start looking at detailed exercises. It's, I think what I like about it is it, it's very much in the moment, it's about now. It makes you realize that the past and the future are just figments of our imagination. They don't exist. You can't go and get a bucket of past and you certainly can't get anything from the future. Um, so the question then arises, what isn't improvisation? Uh, and it is, I suppose, the opposite. It's sticking in the past. It's having plans and sticking to them without necessarily bringing them to life. It can be, it can be a very deadening thing um, uh, or at doing something purely for what's going to happen in the future rather than what's happening now. That's, that's the negative side. Obviously, there are positive sides um, because we are, as a species, we're not the only ones who know about the past and the future. We're certainly other species have memories and can plan ahead, but we certainly as a species do it more than anybody else. And as a result, we tend to get stuck in it. And I find it very liberating to think that only the now, only the present moment exists because before that, certainly, before I realised that, my feeling was, I don't know about anybody else, that the, kind of the past is kind of pressing, pressing up against you and the future is kind of pressing up against you from the other day. There's a tiny bit of present that you're allowed to occupy until you realise actually that present is enormous. It's everything, everything okay. across the entire universe um, with due respect to Einstein. Um, it's all present, it's all now. Um, I guess an obvious question to ask is, if we're being spontaneous, how can you train improvisation? Um, you can train you can train yourself to be spontaneous. I mean, just like musicians practice scales. Um, and in order to be able to then 
forget about it and just do the scales in the same way that we track practice techniques so as to forget about them and just do whatever comes you know it's it, theoretically you could walk on the mat and someone attack you and you just go you go with the flow of whatever their movement is and you find yourself doing something that we would call shianagi for example but the reality is that unless you practice doing shianagi the chance of you stumbling across that move are fairly limited you know you'd have to be probably someone with a buddha-like ability to totally be in the moment and the same applies to acting improvisation you know you theoretically I could say something to you and if you are very aware and adept you could just say something back and it would all work nicely um, the reality is we probably get into a loop we'll probably fall into certain traps and part of the exercise is to learn about those traps and to learn about how to avoid them and to practice avoiding them and it's the practice as with Aikido, I mean, Aikido is very simple. But it's a pra without practice, it's all in your head. And that's what I liked about Aikido, going back to the meditation thing. Sorry, Quentin, I know you were about to ask something, but I just finished my thought. Um, you can think lovely thoughts about Buddhahood and enlightenment, um, but until you've actually put it into practice, you know, nothing happens. And what I like about Aikido is you can walk on the mat thinking, I'm totally enlightened, I'm at peace and I love everybody. And then someone comes around trying to punch you, you say, ah, you know, I'm not so enlightened as I thought I was. And we've certainly found that with verbal Aikido as well. Sure. So um, you said before I, I suggested we do this session that you'd, you'd never actually kind of consciously seen the link between improvisation and Aikido. But when we talked about it, we found quite a few things that were very similar and why why it made sense to do the session do you think that subconsciously your aikido benefited from improvisation training it must have done i mean i think you do anything like that just as aikido affects your life you know um it affects your life i mean you're doing improvisation training although ironically i've never done very much of my own but i've done an enormous amount when i've been teaching others because inevitably you do um and it occurred across my mind that one day it might be fun to go to an improvisation workshop and be on the other end of the, the teaching bit. Um, but there's no doubt about it. When you're teaching, you're doing. And I learnt by teaching it, really. Um, and by seeing the effects that it had on the actors I was working with um, in plays and movies. Sure. So let, let's tick some boxes. You, you've had a bit of a while to, to consciously think about the links between Aikido and improvisation, and I have too. What, for you, are the main things that stand out as being a parallel universe? Well, I think I pretty touched on some of them already, um, that you are practicing being in the moment, because in Aikido, what happened two seconds ago is completely irrelevant. You know, the fact that you've just done a wonderful Kodagesh makes no difference whatsoever to the next guy who's attacking you in the Randori. And similarly, you know, planning what you're going to do in two seconds time is completely irrelevant because you might have been thinking, I'm going to do Senshinagi, and it just, that's not what comes out of what he does. Or you just end up blocking yourself by trying to do something that isn't appropriate. So in the same way with acting improvisation what you've just said there's a kind of logic or you know in a, in a kind of storytelling sense but i've got to react to what you're saying now i might have expected you to say hello and you say take your galoshes off i've got to do something about that so i've got to accept that and move on otherwise the whole thing falls flat on the floor anything else you want to say on that I'm sure things will occur, and but that, that'll do me for the moment. Okay, let's see if I can lead the witness a little bit then. Um, okay, so uh, if you were saying, what are the key skills for somebody who is very good at improvisation? Accepting. Right. That's the first. That's the first and main, and possibly only skill. Okay. Well, um, I, I, let's immediately draw a parallel with Aikido because you have to accept the attack if you're going to yeah. deal with it in a, you know, in a you know, the way that we want to as Aikido students. So that, yeah. That's a really good one. I mean, I do a triangle. Um, I don't know if you want me to do it or I can just do it in the air. Um, but when I'm teaching, I draw this upside down triangle, a triangle where it's pointing at the bottom point. 
and I know we discussed this, and I used words you weren't totally happy with in Aikido terms, but I'm going to use the same words anyway. Okay. Do you want to share a screen if you've got that yeah. prepared? I'll, I'll do that. Yes, I haven't let prepared. Let me make you co-host, be... yeah, maybe. and then uh, you can do that. Okay. Let me just go to there. Okay. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay, let's see if I can find my whiteboard. Can everyone see that whiteboard? Yes. Yep. Good. So let me see if I can do this. You, your drawing's much better than when you did it with me. Yes, I've been, uh, I, I haven't been practicing. It must have just, must have put, fall into place. Okay, so. At the bottom is truth, uh, and that you, you can talk about it as accepting. It's, it's um, you know, you've got to be true. You've got to be uh, true to what you're saying, true to what you're doing, true to the emotions. I'll talk a little bit more about what, what I mean by truth, but particularly true to the inspiration, whatever comes to you that you need to do, and true to what the other person does. And this, very, again, very much relates to particularly Toei Sensei's principles of accepting the key, the key of the other person, except, you know, being aware of what the other person's thinking. If you can be true, uh, and the danger is you try, when people try to reach for an effect, you know, we say, I'm going to be funny now, I'm going to be moving now, I'm going to be emotional now. You've got to, if that's not true, it doesn't work. And whatever you do next isn't going to work. So what people often do, and you see actors do this a lot, is they, it's a bit like a, um, a radio set that's not quite tuned properly, if you turn the volume down, it doesn't sound so bad. And they turn the volume down on their performance. If you are true, then you can turn the volume right up and it's crystal clear and it's beautiful. And so then you can, the next principle is energy. If you're true, then you can expand enormous amounts of energy. And I think that applies to Aikido as well. If you're being true to what's going on, then you can flow with a massive amount of energy. I've been just watching Toei Sensei, um, on YouTube just the other last few days and reminding myself just how much power there was in what he did. You know, it's, you could think he's trying to, he's being too strong, but it's, it's enormously powerful. And I think that's because he's totally true to what's going on. Rather bizarrely, so have I. Right. Um, and then if you have energy and truth, you can start to add variety. Um, so with actors, once they've got the truth and they start putting the energy into the seat, into the, into the performance, then they start to find new and fresh and different ways of doing things. When you start doing improvisation, you'll tend to find you're probably doing the same thing frequently because it starts to feel comfortable and it feels something you feel you can do. But after a while, you start to spread your wings a bit and find other, other things you can do while still remaining true. So can we work our way around the triangle and, and make some links with Aikido here, which is what we did when I, and I when you and I talked. With pleasure. So, so uh, for me, that truth, that accepting process, knowing what's really happening in front of you, it is about, um, is, in Tony says terms, uh, respecting your partner's opinion and um, accepting it, Resp going with that. So. Does that and then the energy is extending key that's that's pretty obvious for me and then when we get to variety i, I would say it, it, it's uh, knowing what options are open to you and being able to know which is the most appropriate of and maybe there's more than one appropriate response but you're only picking from a a, a band that you know are going to work in this situation and, and i think probably that's not a conscious process I mean, you can't consciously think I'm going to do so and so now, as you, as you already said, you just find you've done it. And after the time you got a laugh or you got a tear or whatever it was. Um, but if you were honest, it works. I think I, I would make a slight proviso and with both Aikido and improvisation is there is a conscious element. I mean, there's part of it that's happening instinctively, but there's also a part of you that's sitting on top kind of monitoring what's going on and constantly saying, I've lost one point here, or I've lost, my, and I need to relax here, or I need, you know, in, in improv terms, you know, maybe that what I just said that isn't quite, wasn't quite true enough. I've got to have a little work, bit more of that. 
in Aikido, for example, sometimes, yes, absolutely, you'll do it instinctively. Sometimes you might be working with somebody, you know, and you try a technique and they block that. And that's where I think the conscious mind is working with the unconscious mind because you're thinking, okay, where, what can I find here? And I, and I might work through five or six different techniques and they block each one until I find maybe a Sankyo. Mm. Okay, but isn't that, isn't that just a question of um, we never get perfect at anything, but the more you train, the more often you get it right? Um, yes, and I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I partly agree, but I think we, we aren't, I mean, we, we, you know, Zen tends to venerate cats quite a lot because they totally seem to sit unconsciously just doing their thing. I think as humans, it is there. It, it's only connect. We connect the conscious and the unconscious. I don't think we ever get totally unconscious. We'd be back to being babies then. Um, I think we need to be conscious. I think it's it's. Um, I'm uh, my Buddhist philosophy is very much about oneness. Um, you know the duality of conscious and unconscious. I think it's, it's a mistake to reject one or the other. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The, obviously, the the one's feeding the other. But it's all happening so quickly, it's very hard to consciously think, I made a decision to do this technique or this particular emotion that, in improvisation terms or whatever. Yes, oh, absolutely. I mean, you, what, what tends to happen is the conscious is riding a little bit late. So you realise you're doing a shinagi halfway through doing it. Yeah. So maybe it's the subconscious mind that's making the decisions. And kind of afterwards you think, oh, that was a shinagi or... Oh yeah, yeah that, that was the right line to get that laugh or whatever it might, might happen to be. There's some very interesting neurophysiology where they you know, actually scan brains and find that people often make, make a decision about a tenth of a second before they become conscious of it. Yeah, that is interesting. And I think that does explain a lot about Aikido really. Mm. Yeah, okay. And uh, the energy bits, which you, you, you passed over, but I think is worth discussing because you know, I think if you're not very good at it, then your shin aggies, your tension aggies are probably going to be, you're holding back because you know you're going to, if you force it, it's not going to work. Mm. Once you get more able to be truthful and aligned, another word that you were discussing before, I think you can then put a lot more energy in. True, but, uh, but also there's an appropriate level of energy, isn't there? Yes. Oh, so, yeah. so if somebody is talking to you very gently and you start shouting at them as an improv response, it's quite likely to, to, to be very, you know, to have the different effect to the one that maybe you were trying to create. A bit like if you really put a technique on someone, they don't particularly love it. So yeah. it's always about finding the level and responding from there. Yep. You have to find the listening level. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do. Not just listening, though, Steve, is it? it it's um, <coughs> on board, everything about the person, their body language, the way they're moving, the, yeah. the tone of their voice, um, the now loudness of their voice, um, what they're saying, everything. And but I, I do find, I do find the screen a barrier. Right. If you've got a screen, like a computer, uh, like I just find it a barrier. It's more inconvenient than anything else. Right. But well, I'd agree. There is there is a barrier there, certainly. I mean, even for us sighted people, there's a barrier. Yeah. 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 So I, I, in my business life, I've been using Zoom for the last two years, and it works really, really well. But it's not as powerful as when you're sitting in front of people looking yeah. them in the eye. Yeah. You just get more from that. It is more powerful. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the energetic level doesn't quite come through the screen in the same way that it does when you're face to face. Thoughts, peoples? Are we buying that one? I think. I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I also think. In funny, funny sort of way, it's also harder work, and therefore you end up spending more energy. Um, but. Um, what you don't get is all the little side things that happen. Okay, so we talked about when we're looking at improvisation that you're, uh, when you're guiding people, you're looking to uh, encourage habits that mean they don't fall down a rabbit hole and, yeah. and with a block. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, and it'd be interesting to, I haven't thought about the direct parallels with Aikido in this, but I'm sure there are. Um, and I think the thing to do is why do people block? 
why do people stop themselves and start and and and, and I think there's three fears that people have. Just define what we mean by block here. Um, what I what I mean is is it block themselves in this case um, that um, not you know what inhibits people. Right. And this can apply to all kinds of improvisation because in a way writing is also improvisation and people get very inhibited with writer's block, for example. And you get so it, why are people inhibited? Um, what 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 scares people? What you know? Because I think we all are able to improvise. We do it all the time. Having a conversation. If you can, if you can have a chat with somebody. If you can work, walk into Marks and Spencers and ask for a refund. If you can go and buy a McDonald's, then you can improvise. It's a natural human thing we can all do. Um, but then suddenly we're in front of people and we feel um, inhibited. Um, and I think the first fear. I shall throw this out to people. Anyone with suggestions? What, what what do you think is the what what would you be afraid of that's inhibiting? Might inhibit somebody. Yourself in fear, fear, fear of failure. Fear of failure. Absolutely. What specifically would yeah. mean would be failure? What would represent failure? Making a fool of yourself. Making a fool of yourself. Uh, not knowing your subject and uh, mm -hmm. making a mess. Mm -hmm. Looking stupid. Linda said in the in the chat. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to boil these down into three, um, you know, maybe others, but these are the three I find the primary ones. Um, and the first is being boring, uh, which might come under, you know, looking stupid could, could come, come under that as well, um, because we're talking about an, an attempt to entertain, of course. Um, and in Aikido, you could translate into other things like a fear of just making a fool, fool of yourself in an Aikido technique. Um, now, the interesting thing is, I think there is, in everyone's brain, there's what I call the ideas pipe. Uh, and through the ideas pipe, ideas come from your unconscious at a regular rate of knots. Um, and people think, you know, sort of, they get an idea and think, I'll never have another idea. And they, they sort of hang on to one that's good or they reject one that's bad. And what you do is you end up blocking the ideas pipe. I mean, the irony is that ideas come the whole time. Anyone who's tried meditating knows how difficult it is to switch off the ideas pipe. Um, but you have to accept what's coming through the ideas pipe uh, in order to move on. Otherwise, you just block the pipe and nothing comes through. So in one exercise I do very much when I first start, I, I just tell people to put their hand out and say, OK, what's in their hand? And the, the trick is to start saying it's a before you've even thought about what it is going to be and allow your hand to tell you what it is. Well, it's a, oh, it's a mouse. OK, and then you do something appropriate with the mouse. And this is the other thing that tends to block people. They start to act things. They, they do something. You know, it's a ball. And they go, they, they think they're going to throw it. Okay? They go whoosh. Well, no one actually goes when you throw a ball. You just throw the ball. So it's easy. You know, you, you fall into traps of acting there. But then you start putting your hand out. You think, oh, I've. I've got a cauliflower. That's boring. So I'm, you know, so I, I'll block that. I won't say cauliflower. I'll think of something interesting. The trouble with interesting, it tends to be yesterday's interesting. So it's a bomb, let's say. That's really boring. <laughs> That's my conscious mind trying to think of something interesting. Better to go with the cauliflower. Okay, I've got a cauliflower. Let's do something. I've got another. I've got another cauliflower. Oh my god, there's another cauliflower. I've got a. Suddenly the room is full of cauliflowers. What am I going to do with bloody cauliflowers? I can, start, I can start doing something with that. So it's the basic rule of accepting, accepting what comes. Uh, even if it appears to be boring, then accept it, move on. The second fear tends to be that people are afraid of being rude, uh, offensive in some way. Um, that's a tricky one. It depends who you're working with. If you're working, you know, if I'm in a rehearsal room with actors, usually anything goes and I put out my hand and I've got a sex toy in my hand. Oh, I can't say that. Being recorded, it's going to go onto YouTube. Oh, dear, 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 dear. But I've got to accept that. Now, I may not say it. I may say, I, I, you know, I, I may do something with it, depending on the company I'm with, or I may say, I've got this, oh, um, I'm really sorry I thought about that, but I'm just going to put this to one side and make sure the batteries are in there and, you know, and then I've got to go for something else. You've got to accept what you thought of, even if you can't actually necessarily go use it out loud. And the third thing that tends to lock people is fear of somehow being psychologically revealing. 
revealing something kind of psychopathic about themselves that they are you know you know sort of um desperately you know sort of unpleasant person or have awful psychological hang-ups strangely the only... clint came into paul's eyes you said that i don't know yeah. why i wasn't looking that direction um the irony is that I, if you actually can you know if you say well i've, I've you know sort of play a murderer or play you know um a pedophile or something it is generally audiences will, will won't assume you are a paedophile or a murderer. They will just assume you are actually very good at representing it. So you can draw on your inner dark instincts, all of which all of which all of us have, and accept them without necessarily somebody coming up and saying that's the kind of person you are, Paul. How do you do acceptance if if you're? I'm just curious as to way how you teach people to do acceptance by practicing. So I, 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 use, I talk about those three things in order to relieve the anxieties and then say, okay, let's practice. Why so, don't you have a practice with, with Paul? Okay, Paul. So- um, you up for it, Paul. Sure. Are you happy with that? So put out your hand. Tell me what's in your hand. Horse puppy. I've just been playing in my garden. Sorry, it's what? I didn't catch what you said. Horse, horse pucky, uh, American slang for a uh, uh, horse turd, horse shit. Horse turd. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Okay. So do something appropriate with it. Okay. Right. Put out your hand again. What's in it now? Nothing. I dropped it. It, it, it oh, dropped. Dear. Pick it up quickly. What is it? A lizard. A lizard. Very nice. Do something appropriate with it. Iguana, hold your hand. <laughs> Lovely. I knew, I knew that was down. coming. And no, then I once we get good at that, I will start moving around. So, okay, what's on your left shoulder? Pick it up a quickly. A parrot. Pick it up quickly. Oh, it's, the feathers are coming out. It's old. Okay, it's, uh, we'll do something appropriate with it. Okay. Relieved its feather problem. Okay, what's on your right shoulder? Nothing. Nothing. That's a shame. Nothing at all. Nothing at I think all. You, I think when you put your hand there, you'll find there's something there. What is there? It just drops through. Okay, pick it up. I would pick up what isn't there. Yeah. You'll find there's something head. there. What is it? A diamond of some kind. Yeah, there was something there after all. Yeah. Okay, so I'd be doing that, and I'm, and then you start, you start pushing people further and further. Paul's very good at it, so I could start pushing him further and further. Um, and what I'm looking for is any pauses or hesitations. So you notice a few times, Paul, you said nothing, so I pushed you to find something, mm -hmm. and we found something. Yeah. Sometimes what people will do is they'll they'll go there and, they'll, and there'll be a little hesitation. They say, "What's there?" Um, it's a gun. So okay, what, did, what was your first thought? Because you can tell somebody has just censored themselves. Right. So, so I'll be picking up on the censorship. And after a while, people start to walk, relax and get into that accepting. So then we can move on to other games, mm. such as present giving. Anyone like to play present giving with me? Can I give away the past? Hmm? No, present mm. as in a gift. <laughs> I know. Hugh, would you want to play? You have to turn your mic on, though. Otherwise, it'll be really boring. Okay, we all right? Yeah, we're yep. very good. So, are you ready to play presents? I'm, I'm going to give I'm going to give Charles uh, a present. Okay. Now, the way the the way this game works oh. is we give each other presents. Yes. You hand them through the screen, but you yeah. mustn't predict what you're giving me, and I mustn't predict what you're going to give me. So, rather similar to Paul's game. I just take it and I find what's in my hands and I do something appropriate. But here you've got a bit of a script because whoever gets the present has to say and genuinely, ge gratefully say, thank you, Hugh, in this case, for this wonderful. Now, the words are very precise and important. People try to change them, but if you start changing them, it tends to die. If you, because I mean, we're talking about accepting, if you do blocking in an improvisation, it kills it. If Hugh's, you know, if we're doing a position and Hugh says something like it's Tuesday and I say, no, it isn't, I might get a laugh, but then the whole thing dies on its feet. So we have to accept, and this is a practice, this is a higher level of accepting, 
practice because I've now got words to say and I've got to say them like I really mean them. I've got to say thank you, Hugh, for this wonderful whatever it is. If you, if you do it kind of sarcastically, it just kills it. You know, if you, if you, you know, if, if, if you hands me a, a bit of bird shit and, and I, you know, I decided to say thank you for this bit of bird shit, you know, there's no, the energy goes. So we have to, so we're going to do it to each other. You're going to hand me something, I'm going to hand you something in return, and we keep on going. Okay, Hugh, so... You start, another parallel that draw, draw, is coming out for me is that there can be no anticipation. Yes, absolutely. And it's very easy to start anticipating with this one. It's best not to. So, Hugh, if you'd like to hand me something through the screen. So I'm giving you this gift. Thank I'm... you, Hugh, for this wonderful roll of... It's kind of steel wool. Um, I thought it was all new wool, but it's actually quite hard and steel. But it's going to be really useful for me for cleaning my screen with, because my screen's got a bit dirty with all the work I've been doing and the coffee that's been spilling. Um, and, and thank you. That was really nice. Let me just put it over here for the future. And Hugh, I've got this really nice present for you. It's phenomenal. It's so big, it hardly fits through the screen. But I'll just squeeze it a little bit there. And that is phenomenal. Exactly what I wanted. And, and right your line now. here is thank you, Charles, for this wonderful. So you've got so, to say your line. You've got to say your line. Thank you, Charles, for this wonderful. I guess it's a it's a it's like one of those corporate squishy balls for anxiety relaxation. That I you thought have that on was, your desk. I chose that one for one. you. I, I chose that absolutely for you. I thought it'd be yeah. right for you. What are you going yeah. to do with it? Do something with it. Well, I'm I'm just I'm just squeezing it now here, and and the and the anxiety is just draining away into the keyboard. Lovely, and I Fantastic. believe you have another gift for me now. I do actually, and um, I hope this one will be equally useful as the one that you've given me and the one I gave you earlier. And here you go. Oh, thank you, Hugh, for this wonderful egg. It's a, it's a big one. Judging by where my hands are, it must be an ostrich egg. Uh, I'm going to put it down here and warm it up, and maybe I'll get an ostrich out. Oh, I can hear it pecking already. I'm going to get an ostrich very soon. Lovely. Thank you. And this is for you, Hugh. Well, thank you, Charles. And I, I'm going to have to look at this carefully because it's wrapped up. So I'm going to have Ooh. to unwrap it. it. Took me a long time to wrap that up. I don't know what's inside. And um, I'm just taking off the outer layer. And there's another layer inside of wrapping. I'm just wondering how topical this gift is. It's, it's beginning to look like a Russian doll. But no, anyway, there's a third layer. And what do I find inside here? Lovely. It's a Lego man doing Aikido. You get it. What great fun. Yes. Can you tell what technique he's doing? Well, I, it, I can't. I think it's, he's got a Joe in his hand. So it's some, he's going to break into some form of Joe Catterson. Just for you. Thought you'd like Thank that. You. Thank you. What are you going to do with it? Well, do something, appro do something appropriate with it. Yeah. Um, he's, oh, I've just picked up my Joe and he's run away behind the screen. <laughs> I think... Uh, He's a bit smaller than me, but Lovely. size isn't everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's how it goes. Um, yeah. Would people like to, is it possible maybe to put people in breakout rooms so they can play that with each other and try it out? We could give it a go. Not sure what it does to the recording, but we can give it a go. So let's uh, randomly see what happens here. Um, the, thing, the thing is, put lots of energy in, be very grateful, go with the flow, have fun. There's no wrong answers. Vitaly, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's complicated for me to talk because everybody sleeps in my house right now. So it's going to be complicated to take part in it right now. Okay. Just whisper very quietly. It'll be fine. Yes. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful. Yes. The crazy. How many of them are 12? So we need six rooms. <clears throat> okay here we go uh, okay 
Okay, so you should all have received an invitation, I hope. Steve, I think it's just you and me, buddy. Well, it's you I wouldn't know. Well, <laughs> it's you and me, so we're going to practice a little bit of improvisation. Okay? Well. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a gift, and you have to say, wow, thank you, this is a wonderful, and then whatever comes into your mind is what we're going to play with, okay? I think so. <laughs> okay. Steve, here's a present for you. Do you want me to go to the middle of the screen or am I? No, I just want you to say, thank you. This is a wonderful and go for it. So I'm going to give you the present again. Yeah. yeah. Here, Steve, I got this present. Yeah, for thank, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your uh, gift. What, well, what is it? You, you, you haven't told me what it is yet. I don't know because Fergus has got it. Oh, well, you've got to get it off the dog. Come on, I, I spend a lot of money on that. I don't want him chewing it up. <laughs> oh, he's eating it. I, I'm not sure what it would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I tell you what, you give me a present. So you, say, you so you have to say, Quentin, I brought a wonderful gift. Here it is for you. I, I got a wonderful gift here for you. Um, Thanks, to make Steve. to make up for the previous one. Oh, amazing! It's a courgette. I love courgettes. How did you know I love courgettes? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give this to my guinea pig. Oh. He, he he really loves his vegetables, and he never looks happier than when he's eating a courgette. It gives him a nice shiny coat. I've got another gift for you, though. Here it is. So you have to say, Steve, thank you for this wonderful and whatever pops into your head, off you go with it. Come on, Steve. Go uh, for it. Thank you for your... your uh... Your Wonderful. gift, and I, I, I will cook it later on to eat. Oh, what are you going to make with it? Uh, I will add it to a, uh, a soup or something like that. A soup? What sort of soup will you make? A veg, some form of vegetable soup. But I gave you a joint of lamb. Oh. What, the lamb? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that would in a vegetable soup, buddy. Uh, what? Vegetable. <laughs> All right, don't worry, Steve. I'll let you off the hook. Linda, would you like to play? <laughs> sure. Okay, I'm, I'm back. There was no one in my room. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Linda. Here's oh, a gift Linda. for you. I, I find I just wanted to be thank you for all the wonderful work you've done. Now I can't tell if you're playing or thinking. <laughs> I never play with you, Linda. Just Aww. enjoy the gift. <laughs> well, thank you for this amazing. Wow, what is this? Oh, it's slime. I remember this from when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It's really cold. You I can make sure not to get it on my keyboard. You can never get bored with a bit of slime, can you? No, that's awesome. I'm going to put it here in my bowl of what I had yogurt in earlier. Oh. And and Quentin, I, you know, I, I've had this thing for you. I've been meaning to give it to you. Here you go. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful, beautiful wooden statue of, of I'm really not sure what it is. I I saw it and I completely thought of you. I thought, oh, Quentin has to have this. He would love this. Is this a piece of modern art? Uh, try it from different angles. See what you see. You're right. It's beginning to make sense. It's a hippopotamus, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes. 
<laughs> so, so Quentin, um, I, I, everyone seems to be doing very well. I've been dropped into a few rooms. Do you want to bring them back? Okay. Um, well, bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> I've got 59 seconds to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> So, Shawnee E, unmute and tell us about yourself. Ah. Uh, Hello. Hi, Shawnee. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I had um, a very important um, task challenge that I had to do um, before coming on to this Zoom that I couldn't, um, I couldn't um, not do, I'm afraid. Okay, so I'm going to do a bit of a media improv on you. Don't tell us what you really did, but what did you really do, Shawnee? What was it? Oh, okay. Um, I conquered the world. Did you? Wow, we could do with a I, few more like you. I, I totally have conquered the world. You probably do a better job than Boris. <laughs> well, oh. I think um, when I meet him, he will bow to me. Very appropriate. Anything else you're going to make him do? Um, the Queen is going to bow to me also. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm not going to make her do that or anybody. It's right. just going to it's just going to be a natural progression. Okay. Uh, and what are you going to do? What's your first order of the day in ruling the world? What would you like to change most? Um that we were all born equal. But you're the one. Really? Even you? <laughs> Absolutely. But in a, if anybody wants my authority, I'm not going to hold it back from them. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, OK, so let's open it up for comments. How did people find that? Well, I, I thought it was really interesting. And um, present wise, um, I got a wooden tan tool and uh, a year's subscription to the Automobile Association. <laughs> Very practical. Marvellous. A useful exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, very useful. I, I just so we, our, our theme, uh, Joanne and I, were, 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 is very much Japanese themed. There was a there was a lot of exchange of sake <laughs> flowing flowing through the uh, the internet, and an absolutely brilliant idea of a worldwide um, travel free passport for Aikidoka which could get you entry to anywhere. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. First class. Did, did anyone love what you did? You love, yeah. love the exercise? Did anyone hate the exercise? It was fun. Yeah, it was good. Did anyone learn anything? Um, yeah, uh, imagination really went wild. Um, I was all over the place. Um, I really enjoyed it. Mm. I'd say I, was, I dropped into a lot of the rooms and I was very impressed with what I saw. So perhaps there is some cross personalization between I so, and, and improv, i.e., that we do get used to being in the moment and just seeing where it takes us. I think it seemed to be, it came naturally to a lot of people, yes. I mean, in terms of improvisation, one thing I'd say, having, having done it with you first, Charles, and then doing it again, is that we. On the second occasion, we, we we got onto a bit of a theme there, so you can kind of lead the audience a little bit. Oh, you can do a lot. I mean, this is this is basic. We're we're doing basic, you know, yeah. beginner work in a way. Yeah. No, no, I understand. Um, no, so. And 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 I'm glad. I mean, I mean, the next stage is you start. You can start to play around with it a bit. I mean, one thing that tends to happen is, I mean, people do block sometimes. So we have an exercise for dealing with that, where you have to accept you're being blocked. In other words, if you're working with somebody who doesn't accept anything you do, you have to work. It, 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 the, the game is called It's Not. Who would like to play It's Not with me? Any, any volunteers? Well, fairly any volunteers, I'll play. OK. So basically, I mean, I have to say something to Quentin. And Quentin's job is to say, just basically to block me, to not accept it, to do everything. So my job then is to whatever hoops that I have to jump through, I have to accept his not accepting. Yeah, it'll be clearer when we do it. So, you know, so let's start off with it's Wednesday. Okay, Quentin, hi there, it's Wednesday. You've got it wrong again, Charles, come on. Oh God, I haven't, have I? Oh, 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 oh it, it, it felt like Wednesday, it really does feel like Wednesday. I mean, my calendar's saying Wednesday and everything. The computer must be wrong. 
It isn't wrong, Charles. It's just you. Oh, uh, you're, you're right. It's just me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm always getting these things wrong, aren't I, Quentin? Well, sometimes you get them right. I, I do sometimes get things right. And, and I'm, do, you know, I, I, I really like the fact that you, you give me that respect and you make me feel better whenever I, I speak. I don't respect you, Charles. I had a feeling you didn't. Uh, dear, dear, dear. Um, you know, you're making me feel quite small now. You strike me as a big heap of something. I don't know about small. Uh, but I, I am big. I've been getting bigger. I mean, thanks to your tuition, I've been getting bigger and I've been doing the Aikido and it does make me feel almost enormous, you know, um, sometimes. Should we call that a day? Have we gone far enough sure. with that? We got into a loop there, but yes. So you've made a positive out of all the negative. I have to make a positive out of the negative. Something's come up in verbal Aikido too, actually. That if somebody blocks you, you kind of you have to deal with it. Rather than just block because otherwise you just you just you just again it just dies. So that you know, uh, so you can and you have to you start playing games where you can push people even further. We get you can start being a bit naughty with people. Um, one of my favorites would be great to play if we can get four people together here, or maybe Quentin being Quentin can just. Yeah. Give, <laughs> allocate people. It's called subtitles. Okay. Two people are in a movie in a foreign language that they don't speak. So they have to make the language up. And two people are giving subtitles. So you're each, each, each person is doing subtitles for one person. And the people being subtitled have to respond to what they're being told is going on. So it's a way of being, you know, sort of, of, of responding to the outside forces, as it were, and being open. And the people doing the subtitles, they can't ignore what the people speaking are doing, you know, the tone of voice, but they can play games and they can push them into corners and they can make them jump through hoops and get into awkward situations. Um, if you, you said, in mind, it's a great game. I believe you said that the people doing the, 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 the actors, not the subtitlers, don't know the language they're speaking. That's right. The, how do how does how do the people who are subtitling them know what they're doing to subtitle? That's the point. Okay. That's the but, point. They, you know, somebody says, you know, and the other person and the subtitler says, I love you dearly, Paul. I want to take my trousers off. And at that point, think, the other the actor has to do something about it. Somebody had to know what somebody is doing to say something about it. Yeah, the subtitler makes it up. I mean, okay, it I looks it. like they are interpreting, but in fact, of course, they're making it up. Okay. So it's a kind of reverse thing going on here. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. It won't soon. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, would you like to? Would you like to allocate four people? Okay. Well, well, I, I will. Okay. So, are there any volunteers first? Okay, well done. You're mad that? fools. Charles <laughs> and John, and I want one more. Oh, well done, Shorty. Okay, so I'm going to make Charles and John, no, Charles and Shorty the, the speakers, and you will be speaking, um, what should we say? You've got yeah. to check it's a language you don't, we both don't speak. Yes. I could, uh, yeah, I could talk and Geordie like, you know. Yeah. I mean, you'd I'd, have a job. Uh... I'd prefer not, not to do it, but to have somebody else do it, somebody who, um, who's not me, so I can watch. I can so got... uh, Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer myself then. So I'll, okay. I'll, be, I'll be a speaker. Uh, we might as well go for uh, Chinese, because, you know, it's probably easier. To... Shawnee, how good's your Chinese? Um... I, I can't call I don't know. I can probably do Japanese better. I don't know. That's a, a kind of well, a bit more. You, it doesn't, you don't have to be realistic in this. No one's going to. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can understand what you're saying. As long as you make noises, that's fine. Yeah. And, and who's the subtitlers? Oh, yeah. Taz, Taz, Taz and John. So Taz, you're, you do Shawnee and John, you do Quentin. Okay. And uh, you're obviously, you're supposed to be doing the, telling the subtitle of what they're doing but of course you can be as evil as you like in your inventions what time are you making the christmas cake so shawna you reply subtitle taz i haven't got a bloody clue 
Oh, I've just been uh, Give you yourself title a chance. Go on, John. I've just been on that bus and you weren't on it. I believe I repeated this to you last night. You said that you wanted fish and chips and not a beef burger. <laughs> beef burgers are for wimps. I asked for an emperor burger and he's gone and bought me a bleeding cheeseburger. <laughs> noodles, noodles, noodles. <laughs> noodles, noodles, noodles. Yeah, well, speak for yourself. <laughs> Do we call that a day? Yeah. 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 That's a much tougher game. It's a tougher game, but the trick is to get it into some kind of story, of course, uh, or to get the people doing something uh, extraordinarily embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, I would think the trick in that one is, is to ignore the foreign language and just have a conversation between the two people speaking English. You can, I mean, and you can play, I mean, you know, I mean, like, you know, so Shawnee can say, nyo, 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 and um, Taz can give a enormously long speech for that, which can, you know, sort of, <laughs> you can do all sorts of things. Um, another one that's related to that is um, uh, Apprentice and Master. Um, where, I mean, Quentin, do you want to play this one with me? We, um, this is where I'm, I'm supposed to be the master, Quentin the apprentice, but in fact, Quentin's the one who knows everything that's going on. So the, he's the helping secretary. me. Hmm? The secretary. So, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, you know, and the, the trick, you know, so, so I have to appear that I know what's going on, but Quentin's actually feeding me the information. So, so, so Quentin, hand me that... Um, Oh, the telephone, yeah. Telephone, thank you. Um, I just got to make a call, um, and I need the... Um, telephone number for the Emperor of China? Telephone number for the Emperor of China, absolutely. Um, and and the... the, the um, oh, you want the folk file, the uh, name file. file. That's Name right, file? yes. Yeah. So um, now, the, the, but the, um, the telephone isn't... Um, Connected, no. Absolutely. Um, so, so I need the um, uh, you want quickly. To connect it, I suppose. Quickly. I, you want to plug it in? I'll plug yeah, it in. Absolutely. I'll I want to plug it in. Plug it in. And, and, and then th th I was going to know the Emperor of China. We, we talked about how I was going to say this. Yes, he's not wearing any clothes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just be prepared for that. I, I know I, I have to talk about the, the, the clothes, but you know the ones he's wearing the other day. They, they worry me. He wasn't wearing any clothes then either, was he? Um, I know, and that's what worries me in particular. And and the woman with him. She was enormous, wasn't I, she? I, I, I don't know how to get this across to her. I mean, I've, I've got, you know, the, clo the, the phone's plugged in. It, it, I'm, I'm, oh, there's a strange noise coming through. Um, yes, yes. Have I got... Have, it's the bells. It's the bells. It is the bells. And so on. <laughs> And the great fun with that is neither of us had any idea where we were going to go with this when we started. So there you go. Um, which is I, again pretty much what happens on the map when you're really good, when you're really in, uh, performing well. I think. Let me open it up to everybody else. Anyone got any comments, points you'd like to make to Charles? Questions you'd like to ask? And I just say that sometimes when I'm teaching, and I clap my hands to move on to the next technique walk into the centre of the mat and then go blank, totally forget what I was going to teach. A real senior moment. So what I do is I just improvise. 
I start slinging people around for five minutes until it until. comes back to me. So I suppose you could say that's improvisation. Mm. Yep. Actually, my whole teaching philosophy is kind of based on that. I usually <laughs> start with one word. Yeah. I'm going to teach this, and I have no idea where it's going to go or what yeah. I'm going to say. Yeah. But it kind of usually makes sense to me at the end. I think, oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I wish yeah. I'd said that before. <laughs> Works for me. Anyone else got any comments or questions or thoughts? Yeah, I can see a real um, parallel with the blocking. When you think, especially you'll see beginners like they freeze up in a in a freestyle. Like, oh gosh, what technique should I do? Like one kind of came to them naturally, but they'll stop themselves and go, oh, I I should do kodagaiji, and it never comes across as natural. Mm. Yeah, very true. I mean, it just reminded me of another parallel um, because when I'm teaching, very much I'll say, just do particularly with beginners, do the escape, move out of the way, and the rest will occur to you will come to you and so often it does do your rimi or tenkan and then it obviously everything else falls into place yeah there's something where i'm moving and something inside of me decides to do a movement that i didn't know i was going to do this morning for example i was teaching a, an online aikido class and somebody said the power has to come from the feet i said no it doesn't i jumped up in the air and punched I'd never done that before, but I knew that there was a way to not have the power coming from my feet and still have power and not be disturbed. So I, every once in a while, something does something that I don't mean to do, or whatever it is that doesn't mean to do something or something. Must be that light bulb moment. Yeah, well, I don't eat too many light bulbs, but I had one for Brecky. Well, I don't know how many guys and girls have found this out so often. Um, I will find myself saying words on the mat and thinking, wow, I didn't know I knew that. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know you knew it either. No. <laughs> I certainly find myself doing techniques I think I didn't know. Mm. You, you don't, every now and again, a technique falls into place, think, oh, that was, was rather good. Yeah. No idea how to teach it now. <laughs> I, I did find that when we we're doing the present exercise that I, I, kind of went back into my comfort zone and went back to the past um, um, you know like to think about what present I was going to give next um, I don't know if that's um, anything related to do with either. Well, I'll ask you a question then so you were working from your comfort zone but presumably you did feel a little bit stressed at the same time. A little like stumbling right. like on you know what, what item to pick yeah so I, I i feel that kind of in aikido you need to be dealing with something that you know but you need to be pushing the boundaries a bit and then you to take on board an exercise like this you're having your boundaries pushed so to kind of go back to the bits you know and operate from there that's a good balance i think because you can't go somewhere where you've never been you'll just trip up straight away and, it, and it's partly practice you know, I, I found even just then when I was working with Hugh doing the, the gift thing, you know, my mind was flashing as he was giving me a gift. I think of all sorts of things I was going to say, and I, I basically had to ignore them and just allow whatever happened to happen. So I had done the same thing. I'd gone into the past and thought of other things. And I thought, OK, that's fine. OK, I've done that. Now let me find out what I've really got. <laughs> but it's interesting what Quentin said about boundaries, because I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the next stage on, really. And it applies to writing as much as it applies to... Aikido and to improv, um, I think we all have our boundaries, our comfort zone. I, I don't think it's very comfortable in the comfort zone. Often it's, you know, but we, you know, we, we, it's a safety zone. Um, but we need to take risks as we learn. One of the things I, and I often say this to Aikido students as much as I say to, to, to writing and acting students, you know, it's a you know, process of moving from ignorance to, you know, sort of, um, you know, in, in the first stages, we don't even know a technique exists. We know, you know, it's like walking. We don't know. We all, at one point, didn't know that walking existed. We were little babies. And then we knew walking existed, but we couldn't do it. And then we started doing it and found we couldn't do it. And we fell over. We tried doing it, fell over, tried doing it. Babies are stupid. Adults know that that's the point you're supposed to give up. But babies keep going. And they go through the boundary to find themselves starting to do things they didn't think they could do. 
Um, and then, but that, you're still kind of thinking, having to think about it, do it consciously, and then gradually get better at it till you start doing it unconsciously and you get unconscious competence. And then you've got a bigger boundary and then you can, you know, if you're lucky, life will push you against that boundary. So you have to find something else that you can't do that you have to learn to do. Maybe you learn to dance, maybe you do Aikido. You, you thought you'd do one technique, you have to learn another technique and so on. Um, and I think for, it's, for me, it's a pretty good definition of life, actually. They were always going through a boundary. And just a little story, if you don't mind me quickly. Um, I was do, working with some actors. We were using improv and we were working off scripts. And I did, I did generally two day workshops at the Actors Center and we'd done a day and a half and they'd done as much as they could do in that day and a half really. And they were okay. They weren't brilliant, but they were okay. And I thought, what am I gonna do for the rest of the afternoon? And kind of like Paul, I sort of, you know, and, and John, I started improvising something. And I thought, okay, we'll go back to what we, the scripts you've got, and we'll do them again, but this time I want you to take a risk. Surprise yourself. You've got the words, you can't move off the words, but do something, move in a different way. So use a different tone of voice. Surprise the person you're working with. And the interesting thing was, I'd been thinking for a long time, what makes an actor special? You know, three actors can play Hamlet, one's special and the others aren't. You know, um, same writers, writers only have 26 letters of the alphabet. We've all got the same words to work with, but one has a voice, something special, something that stands out. And what happened when these actors started taking risks is they started to create their own distinctive voice. They started to be special. They started to be more than just competent. And that kind of answered that question I'd had for a long time, which is what makes you special, what makes, gives you a distinctive voice, I think is taking risks. It's going through those boundaries. It's scary because risks means you can fall over. We all, we all know that, but Annette, without risk, without going through the boundaries, I don't think you've got anything. I'll ask you one more question, Charles, and then Hugh's got something he's gonna read us from Toby Sensi. Uh, in your writing process, so I, I've written a little bit in my time, only short stories, but I've written a bit. And um, when I start a story, I don't necessarily know where it's going. I really do get into a stream of consciousness and, and, and it, 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 it finishes. And I think, oh yeah, that, that's good. That, that feels nice to me. When you're writing, how much of it is driven by kind of, you know, that higher voice, which seems to speak to you, the muse, if you like, and how much is driven by the structure and the fact that you have to be, you know, be disciplined in your writing and find time for it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, you, there's an implication that I wouldn't necessarily agree with, which is that the structure itself isn't driven by a higher voice than the muse. I mean, it's, it, all, it all comes from a certain place. The structure will have come from me improvising stuff onto a page, making doodles, connecting things up, making lines saying, there's the beginning, there's the end. Um, and it, it's a kind of spectrum in a way. I and mean, at one end of the spectrum is what you're describing, which is being what's the trade called pantsers, going by the seat of your pants, not knowing anything. Um, I'm not convinced that people know nothing. I think they may have a sense of where they're going. They may have a vague feeling of how it's going to end, but essentially the pantsers. The other end is complete structure. My feeling is you need a bit of both. Um, it's a bit like designing a holiday. You know, if you're booking a holiday, you know, one end you don't plan at all, you turn up and the hotel hasn't been built yet. And, you know, I mean, um, the other end you plan it so much that it, it says, this is 9 a.m. It says I've got to go on the beach, but it's raining. It doesn't matter, it says you've got to go on the beach. Um, somewhere between the two. So I'm, I am somewhere between the two. I will plan um, short stories. It's easier to, 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 to go without any plan because they, they can sort of roll out in their own sort of way. It's much more difficult to write a novel in that way. And I do tend to like a bit of a plan. Um, the less plan you have, the more editing you have to do. But somehow you always have to do editing anyway. Um, but they all come from a kind of improviser. They all come from a balance. I mean, the old E.M. Forster line, only connect the prose and the passion and both will be exalted. There's, there's prose and there's passion. Mm. Um, and you need both. You need the, the intellect, you need the, the conscious mind, the bit that says, it's a lovely idea, but it just doesn't work. Mm. And you need the bit that says, that works, but it's just a really, really lousy idea. <laughs> well, balance is a very Aikido word for me too. Chip Q, did you have the piece you wanted to read? Unmute. 
since we started talking at the beginning, since Charles started talking uh, at the beginning about the conscious and the unconscious and indeed the subconscious, um, I just pulled out the, the little key sayings book from Toei Sensei, which has a chapter on this. It's a very short chapter uh, called The Subconscious. And it says, the subconscious mind acts as a storehouse of knowledge and past experiences. The materials stored in the subconscious mind form the conscious mind. Henceforth, let us cease putting any minus material into the subconscious. Let us always extend a plus key and live our lives with a positive attitude. Oh, that sounds like a really good way to finish a session. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, so um, I think unless anybody else has anything they would like to ask or say to Charles, I, I will close it here. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you, as always, for coming along to these sessions. I thank you, Charles, particularly for sharing your knowledge and uh, wisdom on this. Thank um, you for inviting me. Uh, good fun. I, I, hopefully people enjoyed it as well as sort of seeing uh, sort of the parallels and um, give me a subject that you'd like to explore and I will try and find someone to present it. Or we can just discuss it ourselves if you like. Until the next time. Okay. Yes. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Charles, and for taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Okay. Bye. Excellent.